Okay, well, um, welcome to the last in the series. Um, it would be interesting in a sense, we might take a couple of minutes just straight up to, for you to capture your own sense of what, if anything, you've learned or your, how your insights into Matthew have changed since that first Wednesday morning about 14 weeks ago. We might want to start by just knocking the kettle down a bit as well as sort of brewing up a storm down the back for some reason. Um, okay, so just as in terms, if you think back, the essays are behind you now. In fact, they're in front of you. They're all out in the front here, but uh, I'll give them back later so there's no tears on the video recording, okay? So but we'll just wait till the break. Um, no, overall, they're pretty good, actually. Um, so just in terms of the, uh, the journey we've had with Synoptic Gospels in general and the Gospel of Matthew in particular, um, what's, been, what's been the highlights of the semester, assuming there have been any, but you know, what, what have been the kind of the aha moments or the insights into dealing with Gospels, gauging with Matthew in particular? So all the messy dynamics around the end of the first century. Yeah, yeah. You didn't have it all worked out. He was part of the process of yeah. trying to work it out, but they didn't have it all worked out. In fact, everything looked to be up in the air, really. Where is Jesus? Where is God? Where to now? All those sort of stuff. Yeah, okay. Mm. Okay, so hearing Matthew in, or whichever gospel, but hearing them in stereo, in effect, instead of mono, <laughs> listening for the different nuances of a bit more bass or a bit more treble or whatever. Mm, that's interesting. I was, and in, as I was getting some of the material ready for today, one of the things I did was to go through, and you, you may have seen it or you may have been too busy with essays, but I created the secret gospel of Matthew and stuck it up on Moodle for you. Okay? And uh, it's basically the bits of Matthew that are never read in the, in the lectionary, but which are unique to Matthew, and therefore we, don't, we also don't hear them in their Lucan form or their Markan form. Okay? So I, a bit tongue-in-cheek, I called it um, secret Matthew. Okay, but just so copy and pasting those bits, courtesy of accordance, put in the reference, da da, copy paste, da da, which actually means you're paying attention to the text in a different way. I started noticing some elements which are clearly sort of Matthean redaction, just in those bits because of just copying and pasting those sets one after the other and doing that as a task. I started noticing things about the text which you don't see when it's three chapters separated and. And, we, and, all, and all we ever hear in church is a soundbite, a paragraph here or a paragraph there, whether it's morning prayer or Sunday Eucharist or whatever. We rarely get to hear the gospel in context, whether it's the parallels or whether it's just what comes before or what comes two chapters later, which could be a month later or may not even occur in the lectionary. So we, we do miss out some of those bits. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think reading... Um, or consciously paying attention to Matthew within the context of the New Testament canon and kind of so where are, to what extent are Matthew and the Pauline communities in dialogue because Antioch is not a foreign territory to the Pauline tradition um, so what's going on there and uh, and the Johannine tradition what you know how do we how does all this hang together what what was Christianity like around about 100 AD if you've got the Pauline letters beginning to come together as a collection, you've got the you've got the synoptic tradition kind of consolidating, and and you've got the sort of Johannine tradition, you know, sort of also coming to its canonical final kind of shape, you know, somewhere in the 90s, around about 100, whatever. Um, and if we could have been there and, and observed what was going on amongst the Matthean Christians and the Pauline Christians and the Johannine Christians, none of whom would probably have called themselves Christians, but leaving that aside, would we have picked the winner? Would we have been able to project um, what Christianity would look like 200 years later? Or could it have gone different ways? But as it turned out, some sort of uh, coalition between Paul and John really became the future of Christianity, and Matthew became in a sense, the track, the road that wasn't travelled, the road less travelled in terms of the, the more Jewish kind of agenda. 
That's a lot cheaper than paying a fare. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Makes it all worthwhile. I'll get off my soapbox shortly. <laughs> <laughs> it's concentrated soapbox as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I hope it has been a yeah. Uh, think about those connections, and really, today's topic is also about thinking through those connections, and particularly exploring. How, so, how do we actually encounter this stuff in the gathered liturgical life of the church? Okay. Not in the lecture room, not in the library preparing an essay, but how do, how does how do the larger majority of the church you know, participants, how do they encounter Matthew? And, um, and what's our role in that as clergy or as Bible study leaders or theologically literate members of the community? What's our, what's our kind of role in helping people engage with Matthew? One of, one of my friends, um, um, one of these, you know, Facebook internet friends he never met, never meet, and he's now unfortunately so, so frail that he can no longer do um, stuff on the internet even because of his oxygen mask and all the rest. But he was a Church of Christ missionary in the Philippines, and he talked about spending a year with Rabbi Matthew. Mm -hmm. We may not get back to Rabbi Jesus, but we can listen to Rabbi Matthew for a year and hear what he has to say about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, it's a nice, nice way of talking about it. Okay, so let's get in and have a little bit. So the, the big issues, I guess, we'd want to look at, I want us to look at today anyway, are uh, um, overview of you know, where Matthew and the lectionary kind of intersect. Um, some th little bit of thinking about, so what's this big picture significance of Matthew's version of Jesus for us today? And then doing a little bit of thinking about what's the professional practice then around preaching and shaping an educational ministry or whatever within the parish so there's a whole other semester of work and we'll have an hour or so to have a look at that okay so uh, as you may or may not have picked up by now this is one of my favorite verses out of matthew indeed one of my favorite verses out of the bible it's my kind of um that's that's i guess my CV, not CV, that's my kind of job description, I think. Our job description in some ways. Every scribe who's been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And that, to my mind, is that's what I do, I hope, as a biblical lecturer. And that's what I do as a priest as well, of course, is you're going back into the shed and you're bringing out just the right bit that's needed for the job at hand. Sometimes it's an old bit, sometimes it's a new bit, and that's why you were right not to throw out that old stuff, even when your spouse said, why are you keeping that junk? Okay. <laughs> All right. So the year of Matthew means that in a sense, this year our shed is Matthew's gospel. That's the shed we're going into Sunday after Sunday to see what we've got in here that might be relevant to the job ahead of us this week. Now, the job ahead of us this week is, is the same job every week, but it's you know how to live faithfully as a Jesus person in our particular location. But, what's, but the dynamics and the particular contour of that role will change from person to person, from day to day, one situation to another. So thinking of the year of Matthew and the Matthew's Gospel is our kind of shed where we're going to drag out the stuff we need. So most of you I'm sure have done 115 by now, um, liturgical theology. But it's, it's interesting to reflect on the changes that have come about with the, intro, with the shift from a one-year lectionary to, to say a three-year lectionary. And that's basically a change that happened um, after Vatican II and was then very quick to, quickly picked up by the liturgical revision process, um, with, especially within the English-speaking world. So once the, uh, the Church of England and the other parts of the Anglican Communion began to really experiment with liturgical change through the 60s and 70s, um, one of the most significant parts of the change, although it wasn't the bit which caused the most angst, that was changing the Lord's Prayer, because um, that was the bit everybody knew that's what that's exactly how it had to be said okay 
Um, but I think in many ways the most significant change of the liturgical revision process was the, was the move to the three-year lectionary and the, and the fact that it was an ecumenical lectionary which even the Baptists and Church of Christ were using on, on their, their own sort of calendars but they didn't say this is the Catholic lectionary. They just said these are the recommended readings for each Sunday of the year and lo and behold they happen to be the same as, the, as the, what was then called the common lectionary which came from the Vatican. Okay, so it's interesting. So, right across the suburbs, everybody who was in church on particular Sunday, whether they were Lutherans, Anglicans, Baptists, whatever, um, they were reading the same, they were hearing the same passages of Scripture. Okay, now it wasn't happening in the Assembly of God where the pastor picks his own hobby horse and runs with that for as many weeks as he wants, and there are plenty of other churches, including some Anglican parishes, where that happens as well. But to the extent that the local congregation followed the lectionary that was recommended by the um, church authorities you had basically a shared encounter with scripture which was actually escaping denominational boundaries so if you caught up with a friend during the week who went to the church across the road they probably had been listening to the same reading and so there was more commonality there it also meant that we, we began to dip into more of the gospels than we had done previously Okay, where we go through the cycle every 12 months. So although a lot of the angst was about um, uh, things like changing the wording of the Lord's Prayer, introducing the greeting of peace, actually talking to people, um, and, and probably dropping the these and thous, you know, they were the things that people noticed and reacted to. Uh, and of course bringing the altar out from the wall, if you can remember back that far, that was another controversial thing. I think actually the most significant thing was the change to the lectionary, which kind of went under the radar. Okay, but I don't think people realised how significant that change was going to be. So, as I said, it was widely used in the main li mainline churches, and it, it has meant that congregations, to the extent that they're in church regularly, okay, actually get a broader exposure to the Gospels. Now, because one of the other changes that's happened since the 60s down to now is that people are less likely to be in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Uh, people's patterns of participation have changed. Um, so yes, I mean, my experience would be there's probably about, say, a quarter of the congregation, of the, the, the regular congregation, who will be there every week, and the rest have this secret roster they never show to the parish priest, where they only turn up about once every three or four weeks. Okay. Now, what I've always done in a parish, I always mark the roll. Not during the first hymn, because there wouldn't be enough people there, but as soon as I get home after church on Sunday, I sit down, I go through the parish roll, I just, I just have an Excel spreadsheet, and I just quickly mark who's there that Sunday. Now, after doing that for a few months, I know people's secret roster. <laughs> so I know... Maybe you were like the, um, you know, the backup for um, Jesus' hard drive. <laughs> Yeah. So if God ever wants to know who's, who's here. Um, now, why did I do that? I, I don't really know, except that when I was a kid growing up in Lismore Church of Christ, my mum used to do that for the minister. We always sat towards the back of the church, and mum was kind of the de facto parish secretary in some ways, and so she always, for one particular minister, that when I was sort of in uh, late primary, early high school, um, Mum always marked the role and then gave it to him after church. So he knew who was missing and who to visit. Okay? And so I just picked that up, I guess, in the back of my head somewhere. When I was in a place of my own, that's what I was doing. And what I found was I would get to know people's rhythms. So I knew the people that came every week. So there was a solid column of ticks. I knew the people that came fortnightly because there was one on, one off, one on, one off. That was their roster. I knew the people that came once a month, whatever. Okay? Did you ever say no, but I've people, but people knew because if then if they broke their pattern, I'd ask, does anybody know where so and so is? Yeah. I haven't seen them for three weeks or they, whatever. Um, but you didn't bother to ask if they were just it was just their regular. They only come every two weeks or whatever. And then eventually people realised I was paying attention and marking the role, so they would tell me in advance, we're going to be away for the next two weeks. So they would check in before they went and let me know that you know they were going to be away because they were they had a sense that you know I was keeping tabs and if if there was a 
ch an un a change of attendance pattern for a reason that was not known to the community, I'd check on them. Had they suddenly become ill? Had they gone away? Had their, their daughter had an emergency that called them away for family care, whatever? So it was just part of a pastoral care. It wasn't actually marking the role, but it was, it was staying in touch with the, with the pulse of that community. So I knew where they were. Okay. So, the, so yes, it, I mean, it's not the case that most people come every week. But, and that's part of the uh, sort of flawed logic of the lectionary, okay? It really works better if people are there every week, but we're in a, we're in a stage of social life where every week in anything is, is pretty uncommon these days, whether it's bowls or whatever. So, but still, there's been a, a much broader exposure to the Gospels. Um, and therefore, as we've been saying, there's at least an, a sort of um, there's some kind of invitation implicit there that we might actually notice and pay attention to some of the nuances between the Gospels. So we might notice in the year of Luke that he, he seems to be a lot more interested in people with money and power than Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel seems to be really interested in Jesus sort of zipping around everywhere, ticking off this and ticking off that, and a real action man kind of figure and so on. Okay, So in this case, the, um, the invitation is to really attend to the Matthean angle on Jesus. What's Matthew's kind of emphasis? What's Matthew's take on Jesus? I'm resisting saying Matthew's spin because some people would think that was a professional reference. But, you know, what's, what's, what's the take? What's, what's the angle that Matthew's taking on Jesus? Okay. So spending a year with Matthew, what might it look like? Well, one of the questions one might like to think about then, how would that affect our preaching if instead of thinking about this Sunday's reading we, we were had in mind for the year, now we're, we're kind of doing Matthew this year. So, okay, I know during, during um, uh, Easter we'll do, we'll do a lot of John, um, but you know, this year is the major lens for, our, um, for preaching in the Eucharist is going to be Matthew. And how will that impact on me as a preacher as I prepare for this year and so on. Okay? How might it affect our preaching, but also how might Matthew's emphases impact other aspects of the parish in terms of our wider mission and our wider educational and service kind of agenda. Okay? Is it going to make any difference or is it just like water off a duck's back? We're just going to read it on Sunday. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Now let's get down to business. We've ticked that off. But we're not actually going to take it on. We're not going to let it soak in. So if we were to spend a year consciously with Matthew, and not just... And even what I've found useful is, is at, very, at the beginning of the year, at Advent, to actually introduce that idea. Well, guys, we're, we've just finished Mark, but we're now going to hear what Matthew thought needed to be added to Mark. So we've spent the last 12 months listening to Mark. Now we're going to hear someone who actually had read Mark and thought it needed a bit of an improvement. So now we're going to follow, actually it's other way I'm going on to Luke after that, but you know, sort of, so you can sort of put an angle on how you're, how you're going into it. Um, so the two big questions, certainly in, I think in Matthew's case, probably all of the, each of the Gospels would be, what do we make of Jesus? You know, the Matthew 16, 16 type question. Who do you think I am? So what, what's, what is the significance we give to Jesus? How, without being all pious and devotional about it, but what's the, how much influence does Jesus have in the way we do church? Okay. And, um, and then related to that, I guess the question, so what does it mean for us to be disciples of that guy? here and now. Not what does it mean to be Anglicans, or what does it mean to be Salvos, or what does it mean to be Baptists, but what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, that kind of Jesus in our kind of community? And how are we going to nuance that? Okay. So they're the kind of, and they're the sort of issues you might well want to uh, work through in home groups, or you might want to work it through with a, a parish council or a parish council retreat or even a parish camp or something early in the year and make that a to get it on the agenda 
so people, not just the priests, but everybody's sort of got this as part of the agenda. Okay. So what about lectionary Matthew? I was going to chuck up a couple of dot points. I don't want to go to the documents involved. So what I'll put up on the website for the Moodle site for you are the files that have the data for Matthew in the revised common lectionary. And we all know the difference between the common lectionary and the revised common lectionary. Am I just used because I'm assuming you've done this stuff in in liturgy one oh one. Well, the revised common lectionary is what we use, and the common lectionary is the original version of it, and it's still used by the Catholics. Okay, so the sort of common lectionary was the three-year lectionary that came out in the sixties, and um, it was very much driven by the gospel. The the main continuity was in the gospels, and to a lesser extent through the New Testament reading, the epistle, and the Old Testament reading was picked more or less. Well, it was picked to match the gospel. It was not picked to provide continuity of reading the Old Testament in parallel to continuity of reading the Gospel or the Apostle. Okay? So the dominant reading was the Gospel, and secondarily the reading from the Apostle, from typically Paul, and they tended to be in continuous readings, week by week by week, and the Old Testament reading was chosen to reflect on the Gospel. And the Psalm, of course, is chosen as a response to the Old Testament reading. That's the logic of the lectionary. Now, a number of people felt that the exposure to the Old Testament was then too fragmented. Okay, and you had to bear in mind that in the old prayer book, prior to the liturgical revision, you didn't get an Old Testament reading at Mass anyway. You got the Epistle and Gospel. Okay, collect Epistle and Gospel for the 23rd Sunday after Trinity or whatever. Okay, um, you got the Old Testament reading if you went to morning prayer. If you just went to Holy Communion or went to Mass, you got the Epistle and Gospel. So or even to introduce an Old Testament reading as part of the three-year lectionary was an innovation. People were getting a bit of Jewish Bible served up every Sunday when they went to Mass, okay? which had not been the Christian way of doing things for the last 2,000 years. We are living in revolutionary times and we just assume it's always been like this. Okay. Now, sure, if you went to a, a much more sort of Protestant church, as I grew up in, you'd have a reading from the Old Testament and a reading from the New Testament, but it may not be the Gospel. It would just be an Old Testament reading and New Testament reading. But if you're in a more liturgical tradition, so Catholic, Anglican, um, Lutheran, you would have Epistle and Gospel. Okay. So introducing the Old Testament back into the worshipping experience of the Sunday congregation was actually a big idea that came out of Vatican II and the liturgical renewal movement. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was just a... Yeah, I mean, it, when the altars were against the wall and when you used to move the missile stand from one side, from this side to that side so the priest could read the gospel, that's why the candles were called the epistle side or the gospel side. Um, that whole language has disappeared because we no longer read the gospel at the altar and we don't move the missile, change the side of the missile. So the chapel won't burn down and It'll be singed around the edges, but it won't burn down. But it's interesting what's, what's shaped in. Like, I still feel awkward if I walk while the Angelus is playing, is being run, because when I was a student here, everybody stood stock still. And no matter where you were on the veranda or whatever, you stood up and you were silent during the ringing of the Angelus. And so the idea that you're walking towards the chapel, it's like I'm doing something really naughty, you know. I'm just, Good thing I've got rubber shoes on, you know. Okay, so it's so ingrained and that's that's it. So there are and since the resistance to liturgical revision were things like but the priest hasn't got his back to us anymore. And it doesn't look like he's playing with crabs, you know, the, down by the beach sort of thing. I think you can see the Yeah. And you've got to turn the design round to the front of the chasuble. Um, and they changed the Lord's Prayer and they're doing this hello stuff in the middle of church, please. I don't come to church for that. Whereas the really important stuff like engaging the Old Testament, reading more of the Gospels, when, you know, nobody noticed that we'd actually made a significant change in the spiritual diet being served up at Jesus' outlet on Sunday morning. You know? Huge difference. Now the the dynamic between the common lectionary and revised common lectionary, after a while people said, why, you know, 
can't we read bits of the Old Testament in a continuous series as well? Okay, rather than just a soundbite from the Old Testament to match the Gospel. So now we get runs, like we've just started a series through Genesis on the Sunday morning, or we will next Sunday. I'm always a week or two ahead because I do weekly lectionary notes and I'm always thinking about the week after's readings rather than yesterday's readings kind of thing. So, um, so, so, we, so now in the Revised Common Lectionary, it's the same Gospel series, more or less, it's the same epistles, but you get, you get four or five weeks through Exodus rather than just one Sunday in Exodus, next Sunday in Samuel, jumping all over the place. So, so does that mean the Old Testament doesn't necessarily match the New Testament anymore? Correct. That's so, exactly what it means. So you may not be able to use the Old Testament when you read <laughs> as you... I can always fit it in somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's the same as the dynamic between the Epistle and the New Testament. So what we get served up on Sunday is a set of three readings plus a psalm. See, I don't think of the psalm as a Bible reading. It is, technically, but for me the psalm functions as a reflective response to the first reading rather than as a Bible reading. Okay. Now, in the Uniting Church, it'd be different. They see four readings. Which one will we use today? You mean for preaching purposes? No, I mean for worship purposes. Uh, They'll see a list of four recommend suggested readings. Now, which one of those will we use today? Okay, whereas I, as a good Anglican, well, as an Anglican anyway, uh, I go, oh, those are the readings for today. How am I going to react to them in the sermon? How am I going to weave them together in some way in the sermon? Okay, so, um, so yes, it's, it is the case that rarely will the Old Testament now have a direct correlation with the Gospel. If it's just coincidence if it does. Whereas if you're using the common lectionary, and that's what the alternative reading in the Australian prayer book is about, okay, it has the set readings, and then it'll have at the bottom of the list it'll have or, and it gives you an alternative Old Testament reading. That's the common lectionary reading. That will fit. Which will match directly with the Gospel. This is called Lectionary 101, how to read your lectionary. Okay, we should do it in the first intensive in first year. But anyway, that's why people get confused about which psalm to use in chapel because they don't know how to read the lectionary. Okay, um, grumpy, give me that soapbox back. Um, so, so yeah, the, so the the um, the menu has changed now for the Sunday readings, but the gospel is still the the controlling reading from a Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran kind of point of view. Okay, the at the um, the gospel, it's listening to Jesus is the primary thing of opening the Bible. Okay, now you add to that the apostolic voice and the voice from the Old Testament, but the primary listening focus is the Word, and the Word is Jesus, not the Bible. You know? so how do we listen to Jesus? How do we listen to Emmanuel? You know, that's the Mathean agenda kind of thing. So one of the documents we're going to look at in a second is there are only 10 PowerPoint slides this week, so we must still go for two hours, um, <laughs> is, um, is to look at the lectionary data. Second point is to make sure you know about a lectionary Excel spreadsheet which gives you all the readings when the weeks they occur in all the lectionaries. You don't have to go and flip through this. No, no, it's all been it's done. It's all been done. Okay, so that files there as well. In fact, if I click on that, it'll take you to Charles Waller's website. He's a, actually, his wife is a friend of mine, but I've stayed at their place. I uh, know Charles. And one of the things he's got here is the Excel spreadsheet. Um, actually, it's this one here. Okay, and it's just a, a as you'd expect, it's a straightforward Excel spreadsheet that just gives you all the readings. So I probably have it here. Yeah. Um, okay, so going to the top of the screen. Okay, so it's got the first column are the Bible readings in in the canonical order. Uh, let's see if I can bump this up for you. Okay, so canonical order. So when is Genesis 1 used? Okay. Well, in the RCL, it's used here. In the Roman Catholic, which is also the common lectionary, it's used here. So Easter Vigil A, Easter Vigil A, etc. 
in the Episcopal lectionary, because the Episcopal Church USA has a slightly different lexicon, uh, lex, lectionary, as also we do, although not as different as the Episcopal Church. And then it's got the Lutheran lectionary and the United Methodist, because it's, it's done by folk in the US, so it's more for the North American market. Okay. Um, and it just goes through and tells you when a particular passage is used. Okay. So it's just a, a handy tool to have if you're wanting, in some stage, to check when they're on. So I'll put that on Moodle for you as well. Okay, so you've got the lectionary spreadsheet, which we'll don't need to look at in detail. I've also then put up um, a, a PDF which just has those bits of Matthew, or lists those bits of Matthew which occur in the lectionary, and then what I'm calling Sunday Matthew, which is actually the full text of the Matthean lectionary bits. And then my secret gospel of Matthew, which was just discovered in the last 24 hours or so. It's a, it's a groundbreaking ancient document that's just been discovered. Okay. So let's go in. Oh, and then I've also put up the BCP lec lectionary for you. So let's go and look at those. So there'll be all these things across here. So let's just go into it this way. Okay. So this is, that was lucky first up. Uh, just what I wanted. <laughs> so this is simply going through and showing you the, uh, the, the way Matthew occurs in the in the normal lectionary, okay, in the year A cycle. So in Advent, Matthew gets a fair run, gets a good go on all four Sundays. Um, Christmas season, Matthew isn't the major focus, which is interesting. But then Ma Matthew's going to get Epiphany because of the wise men, okay. So in Epiphany, we get a great chunk of Matthew, obviously starting with the... Um, the Magi, um, we then have the baptism of Jesus for the baptism of the Lord, first Sunday after Epiphany, and then we, then we go into the ministry of Jesus, starting in chapter 4, and we go into a series on the Sermon on the Mount, okay, which will then be continued, of course, after Easter. During Lent, as is always the case, we primarily focus on John, because Lent and Easter is when John fits into the three-year cycle. Okay, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, ABC, John tends to be the dominant gospel during Lent and Easter. So that's your basic architecture. So not, not much Matthew is going to be heard. So in terms of a preaching plan, and there's a new idea for the Anglican Diocese of Brisbane, but you have a preaching plan and so on. It's all being recorded, that's right. Um, <laughs> okay, um, you, you're not going to be doing much about Matthew during Lent and Easter. So you think about that, you plan for that, and you plan what you are going to be doing. What, what's, what's your preaching agenda, helping people to get ready for Easter as you go through Lent? Okay, And it might be, well, let's, let's think about, if we're going to be having a whole lot of John, let's think about, let's imagine a conversation between John and Matthew. Let's read John intertextually with Matthew in the year of Matthew. Let's use our imagination alongside the text. Okay? Similarly for Easter time. But then as, they, as we get back into the Pentecost season, which we're about to do uh, in a week or so's time, and I've just finished all my lectionary notes until about August, uh, July 28 or something to cover my absence, and they will come out magically by auto-release. So I've been working through all these things in the last few days. Um, we're, going to, we're going to be delving back into Matthew. So again, thinking about, so which, which bits of Matthew are we in? And for instance, when we get into Matthew 10, the whole sort of mission charge stuff, is, there, is that a good time to be doing something about sort of parish priorities? Okay, and think, don't just wait till it's time to write that sermon to start thinking about that topic and so on. Okay, so you can see we get a great chunk of Matthew right through until um, Christ the King, ending up with that great sort of parable of the, of the judgment day and the separation of the sheep and the goats and as much as you did it unto the least of these you did it unto me okay so there's Matthew in the lectionaries even just that two pager could be quite a useful tool in terms of thinking about where you go um, I probably do but I, I haven't looked at them for a while and then this is, this is the bits that are outside the lecture and then this week I've gone back and actually created full text versions of this so these are the bits of Matthew which you won't find in the Sunday lectionary okay and sometimes it's because parallel 
passages occur from Mark or Luke, so in the cycle of the three years they don't bother to read the same story three times, but some stories we do read three times. Which stories do we read three times and which stories do we only read once? There's a judgment being exercised by the lectionary committee there. And, and of course, with, even within the lectionary, they'll often omit certain verses, particularly in the epistle, but sometimes in the gospel, and more so in the Old Testament. And it's often fun to look at what's been left out of the lectionary, even though we're reading this chapter, why have we omitted these verses? What is it about those verses which makes them uncomfortable? Yeah, that kind of thing. Okay. And then the bits that are read are the bits that are not in the Sunday lectionary but are unique to Matthew. So they will never be picked up in another year. And that's the basis of secret Matthew, of course. All right? So that's one of the tools that's there this week. Um, let's go back and look at the difference then if we look at the BCP. And this is um, what I've done here. I've, I've simply gone through the one-year cycle of the uh, Collect Epistle and Gospels for the Book of Common Prayer of 1662. And, and if the reading, if the Gospel reading is from Matthew, I'll put in the text as from the BCP, so it's that translation. And if it's from John or Luke or Mark, I'll just put the Bible reference, but I haven't put the text in. Okay, So that's what's going on here. So Advent 1, Matthew was used in the BCP. Advent 2, we went to Luke. Advent 3, we come back to Matthew in BCP. Advent 4, you go to John, and Christmas Day, you go to John in the Book of Common Prayer. Okay? So it, was, um, so it wasn't the Anglican tradition to hear about, to hear either Matthew or Luke's story of the birth of Jesus at Christmas time. You got John chapter 1, the prologue. Okay? So it's interesting lectionary choices. Christmas 1, Sunday after Christmas, um, you finally got the birth story of Jesus which is kind of, um, in, our, in our cycle, that's um, Holy Family. Okay, Epiphany, well, no surprise, you get the wise men. So you get the Matthew 2 story for the Peace of the Epiphany. We sort of, you know, really have to, in a way, because it's not in any other Gospel. And then Epiphany 1, 2, and so on. So you've got Luke, John. Epiphany 3, you have the first part of Matthew chapter 8 that a couple of you did essays on. But I think he went through to verse 16 or 17. Um, Epiphany 4 is the rest of Matthew chapter 8, um, which includes the calming of the sea and, and the, um, the um, guy in the graveyard on the Gadareans. Um, the other thing, of course, is that these Bible versions are based on the Textus Receptus, so they're, they're also um, some of the language, some of the names and verses will no longer be found in a, in a modern Bible because of improved textual criticism. Epiphany 5 is Matthew 13, um, part of the sort of parables section. Epiphany 6, Matthew 24. Um, then we get into Septuagesma, Sexagesma, and Quinquagesma Sundays, which many of you never heard of. But I was ordained on Quinquagesma Sunday in 1978. Um, so Sexagesma and Quinquagesma. And then you get Ash Wednesday, and then Lent 1, Temptation Story, da da, that's going to be from Matthew. It could have been Matthew or Luke, but Matthew was the chosen one. Now, the point here is that the old BCP lectionary privileged Matthew over all the other Gospels. Okay, Matthew was the church's Gospel, the favourite Gospel for the, for the church. Uh, Lent 2, Matthew 15, Lent 3, 4, 5, Luke, John, John. Uh, Sunday next before Easter, also known as Palm Sunday, Matthew 27, that's the whole of Matthew 27, it's the long reading of the, of the um, Passion. Okay. And then uh, Good Friday through to the Sunday after Ascension, Matthew doesn't get a look in, so John gets, uh, tends to dominate there. Interesting, Ascension Day, they read the last couple of paragraphs of Mark chapter 16, which of course are not in the Bible anymore but they were in the Bible in the 17th century. Okay, because of textual criticism, those verses have disappeared. Um, and again, Pentecost, which of course was Whit Sunday. Uh, I did a little bit of translation for you, okay. So Whit Sunday, Trinity Sunday, and Trinity 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 
um, a John and Luke, and then we go when we have Matthew. We have one from Mark. Trinity eight is Matthew. Chunk from Luke and Mark. Back into Matthew. Uh, a bit more from Luke. Another couple of weeks from Mark. From Matthew. Three weeks from Matthew. Another diversion to John. Back into Matthew. Matthew. Matthew and. Um, the Sunday next before Advent was John chapter 6 verses 5 to 14 which is the feeding of the 5,000 in John um, so it's a very different kind of exposure to Matthew's gospel but Matthew is the dominant so in the experience of Anglicans between Cranmer and the 1960s Matthew was the gospel they heard most in church okay and Mark hardly ever. There, I think there were two Sundays or holy days when Mark was used. Well, we went to a three-year lectionary, and so, so then you had to, then you had to bump. So they, so Matthew gets a whole year, but so did Mark and Luke. And in the case of Mark, that's a bit of a challenge because it just isn't enough to cover fifty-two Sundays, and so you get four or five weeks from John chapter six after Pentecost in the year of Mark. And it's a bit of a challenge by the fourth Sunday in a row on John chapter 6. What is there left to say about the bread that comes down from heaven? Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a good time to just have a preaching plan where you, where you get a guest speaker or do something else for those couple of Sundays because most clergy get a bit jaded with John chapter 6 yet again. But it's a long chapter. Okay, so I'm trying to pick up how the... The, the role that Matthew has played in the, in the lived experience of the church changes depending on the liturgical customs and the lectionary practices that are in place. Okay? So the dominant gospel that really shaped the imagination was really Matthew supplemented by John. And that's a very different diet of gospel than what we now get which is um, in year A, it'll be Matthew with John in Lent and Easter. In year B, it'll be primarily Mark, but with John in, Easter, in Lent and Easter and so on. Okay. Uh, so Sunday, Lex, Sunday Matthew, this is just the extra. This is, this, it, it, it's interesting, I think, just, and a, perhaps a useful tool sometimes, just about to look through when you're thinking about sermon plans and just see so these are the actual chunks which I will be reading or somebody in my congregation will be reading which I'll be preaching on week after week this is if you like this is actual Matthew as experienced now in a liturgical congregation so this is sort of lectionary Matthew with all the bits that are not used left out and also rearranged into the sequence so we actually we don't experience Matthew starting with the genealogy in chapter 1 okay that's how Matthew is written but it's not how Matthew is read in church okay we actually start with the um, eschatological discourse you know pr um, pro uh, predictions prophecies of the end of the world is the opening text from Matthew because it's Advent Sunday so we dive into the you know, Matthew 24 rather than starting the story of Matthew chapter 1. Okay? And then we go back to John the Baptist. So we go back to chapter 3. Right, which is why we don't pick it up after Epiphany because we've already done chapter 3 as part of Advent. Um, then we... Um, Advent 3, again, we're still staying with John the Baptist. And then Advent 4 is always a focus on um, Mary, the baby about to be born. So we get the Matthean infancy narrative um, in Advent 4 in the year of Matthew. Okay? So we've, uh, we've gone Matthew 24, Matthew 3, Matthew 11, Matthew 1 in the first four weeks. We've jumped all over the place. So yes, we've jumped into the pool of Matthew, but we haven't listened to Matthew's way of presenting his story. We've rearranged his story in the way we've served it up to people. Okay? There are no Christmas, no Matthew readings at Christmas time in the, you know, in the Christmas services. We tend to do Luke and John. Um, Sunday after Christmas, Holy Family, um, 
we get the um, you know, the sort of massacre of the innocents and the flight to Egypt and the return to Nazareth. Okay. Epiphany, just a big surprise. All right. And then, then we'll go through. Now, um, through Epiphany, we'll get a series of readings. So this is what we saw before, but now it's the actual text, not simply the references for you. Okay, so by looking at those two PDFs, you get the overall table, and then you get the actual, this is the version of Matthew as used in church in revised common lectionary context, okay? All right, uh, so that's that one. And the other one I wanted to show you is this one, which is the tongue-in-cheek one. This is the, so on the front I've just got that same material repeated, and then we go into the, this is the material which is um, unique to Matthew and is not included in the way Matthew is read in the lectionary. Okay? So what's missing? Well, we never get Matthew's, perhaps, with it, perhaps fortunately, in terms of whoever's rostered on to read that day, we don't get to read Genesis, I mean, Matthew 1, 1 to 17. What a shame. But it also means we never get that framing of the story. And we never affirm that there were four women or five women in the genealogy. We never get to make that point. Okay? So that bit of the tradition and that little quirky bit to it, which is a real preaching point, never come, it never gets served up for you to preach if you're following the lectionary. Okay. Um, the Lord's Prayer is not read as a Bible reading. Okay. And yet if we follow Lutz, it's the very heart of the Sermon on the Mount. And the way we deal with Matthew's Gospel in the lectionary, we never deal with that passage. So for our people, the Lord's Prayer is something you get out of the prayer book. It's not something you get out of Matthew's Gospel. On one level, that's maybe not a problem, but I think we've lost something if they don't actually realise, A, there are two versions of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospels, and the one we use in church is more or less Matthew's version, although actually not quite Matthew's version. Okay. Um, and then there's a couple of other, just very short bits that are left out, and they tend to be cranky bits. Yeah, the slightly uncomfortable bits. We don't like cranky Jesus. So but cranky, cranky Greg. Don't like cranky Greg. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> then don't annoy me. And then we get, um, we don't get the healing of the two blind men in Matthew 9, which is something almost certainly, is, I mean, some of the bits that are left out are the, the quirky Matthean bits where he's kind of done something odd with the story, like instead of one blind man, he has Jesus healing two blind men and, the, and this sort of thing, which happens more than once, as it turns out, in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, the demoniac, uh, the, who's also mute and has, and has a demon, uh, the bit about John from the days of John the Baptist till now, again and, and yet again a, a second blind and mute demoniac. These bits get left out. They're sort of they're not judged by the lectionary committee to be worth reading in church. So we miss. So Matthew is partly being sanitised and partly just not being experienced in its wholeness. Okay. And then, and then we have another um, unclean spirit. So a bit of a theme here. If it's to do with exorcism, lectionary committee seems to get a bit nervous. <laughs> oh, well, there's a... Uh, I guess it's an ongoing project. Um, and if enough people say... You know, if there's enough kind... Of, I mean, that was the feedback that led to the yes. desire to, to read the Old Testament in a different way. And it's also why some, in the case of the Australian Prayer Book and the Episcopal Prayer Book in the US, there are some variations from RCL because people have said, actually, no, we're not entirely comfortable with these decisions. So I haven't actually compared this against what's in the Australian Prayer Book, for instance. So Just, the process of yeah. yeah, and so that's, that's going back to the point about putting the passage we've just heard in church 
putting that in a, in the context, not only the context of the other readings today and the context of what's going on in our community, but also what's just before it or what's been skipped and why haven't we heard this or whatever. So just alerting to that, if, if it's pastorally relevant, it's just the other issue. Okay, so some of the stuff is omitted as the more, if you like, pharisaical ritual practices. It's more likely to be omitted. Um, um, we're only going to get the feeding of the 5,000 once, even though in both Matthew and Mark there are two feedings of the 5,000. You only get one feeding of the 5,000 in church. Thank you very much. We've heard that story. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Um, um, so again, we've got both Matthew's stories of the feeding of the, mir the miraculous feeding get left out, which is interesting. So in the year of Matthew, if that's correct, no one gets fed. we don't get the multiplication of the loaves at all in the year of Matthew, because it's not coming out of chapter 15 and it's not coming out of chapter... S Actually, no, chapter 16 is not the actual feeding, it's just Jesus having a bad hair day with the disciples and saying, you guys are so thick. Don't you remember what I did when I fed the 5,000, how many left over? When I fed the 4,000, how many left over? And of course the 5 and the 4,000 don't include the women and kids. Um, like much else in church. Um, again, some more about Elijah and John the Baptist gets left out. Um, the, the, the fish with the coin in its mouth gets left out. That's a bit of an embarrassment theologically. We don't know what to do with it, so we just don't read it in church. Okay. Um, we don't get all of the predictions, all three of the predictions of the Passion. Um, Bartimaeus, or the blind, the blind Bartimaeus in Mark's Gospel has become two blind men. Okay. Uh, in Matthew, and they, that whole paragraph gets omitted in the year of Matthew. Cranky Jesus cursing the fig tree when it wasn't fig season gets left out of the lectionary. Okay. And Jesus' diatribe against the Pharisees and scribes gets left out. We don't read that mercifully. Okay. And um, we do apparently get the graves opening and the dead people coming up for three days and walking around and then going back and lying down like good dead people. But we don't get the story of the guards being spooked by the angel turning up and rolling the stone away from the tomb. So there's quirky kind of bits missing okay so hence my little thing on Moodle but this is the uh, these are these are the texts which at one stage in the history of the church circulated in public use but were deemed by the Gnostic elite in charge of the lectionary at the end of the 20th century not to be suitable for the ordinary faithful to hear okay all right so what I was trying to show you there with those five or six stop points and half an hour is that um, you know there's, there's kind of texture in the lectionary. So it's not just a flat reality. There are decisions that are being made and we won't always agree with the decisions made by the lectionary device. But if we don't stop and look at the big picture, we may not notice what is happening. Okay. Now it may well be that you won't have the opportunity to do much about the lectionary in terms of what you're reading on in the Sunday liturgy but you may want to do other things in home groups or in other contexts which explore Matthew and, and give a, 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 a give some sort of more nuanced overview of Matthew's gospel okay because remember out in the parish you'll be seen as the expert on Matthew okay <laughs> All right, you'll know all about it because you've got a BTH and you did a 12-week course on Matthew, half of which was on Matthew. Okay, all right, so what about the significance of Matthew for today? Uh, and I'm conscious of drawing, a partly drawing here on um, Lutz's final three or four pages, maybe a bit more than that, eight or so pages, at the end of volume three of his Hermonia commentary, where he then talks about the, the, what he sees as the kind of the big ideas in Matthew and then what's the meaning of Matthew and he plays with the same five or so big ideas. I think it is five, which is interesting. Yeah, it's five big ideas. So he's brought on to the five numerical symbolism 
of Matthew's Gospel, consciously or unconsciously. Because we all know sermons are supposed to have three points, but it's five if you're in Matthew. So the, the, one, one of the things about Matthew and about the significance of Matthew for today is the way Matthew talks about God. And Matthew's God is not a theological formula, it's not a sort of philosophical conclusion. Matthew's way of talking about God is God who's encountered and experienced, and in particular, experienced in Jesus. Now, he hasn't got all the Trinity stuff worked out. We're talking first century. But Matthew's way of talking about God is, is about a God who we encounter in our own lived experience. And it's the same God who's been talked about in the biblical documents, hence all the fulfillment stuff that's going on. So one of the uh, possibilities then in terms of exploring Matthew and thinking about how Matthew shapes our our journey of discipleship in a particular year is, is to focus on the sort of God question. Invite people in the parish in safe context to talk about their experience of God at work in their lives. And actually if we say, if we one of our insights into Matthew is that Matthew is a gospel which arises out of diverse households of faith talking to each other about their memories of Jesus, why aren't we doing that as well? Encouraging people to talk about their experiences. Okay? So for instance, last Sunday night I was sitting in the, in the little community at Forest Lake that meets first Sunday of the month called Flack, uh, sorry, Flawed actually, Forest Lake Anglican Wine Drinkers, <laughs> F-L-A-W-D. Um, and it's at what used to be my 5 p.m service when I was the priest there and it's now just a community of people who get together like a home group I guess once a month um, and so Lorraine was the priest from Inala was doing the service and we, we did the um, ascension reading and then we just we had about 20 people sitting around a circle from eight-year-olds to well through young young late teens early 20s through to their parents and just having this free-flowing conversation what what strikes us out of that reading what's and people just um, discussing very naturally what sense they made of the ascension story, okay, and how puzzling or confusing and so on it would be, and and it was just a it was a safe place to have a conversation and for people to share ideas, okay. So there wasn't a homily in that case because of the context, but um, you had both Lorraine and myself in the group. And you had a whole lot of other people, professional people in their own lives, just reflecting on, so what do we do with this? Where do we go with it? That kind of thing. Yeah, because yeah, if we're not people who have and share experiences of encountering God, what are we? <laughs> I mean, what is church? Is it a religious memory club, a culture club for religion enthusiasts? I mean, what is church if it's not a safe place to talk about the encounter with the sacred okay so that's one of the things that Lutz would would invite us to take out of Matthew and try to implement I'm suggesting we try and implement that in the way we we uh, engage with the year of Matthew which of course we're halfway through almost half we're yeah, halfway through the other point, uh, the second point that Lutz brings out is that what Matthew is about is offering his community, which is, in a, as we were commenting earlier, beginning of the session, uh, there was no clear pathway forward for the Matthean community. The way forward was not clear. So what does Matthew do? He says, well, let me tell you again the story we all know about Jesus because this is the story of where we've come from. This is our foundation story. This is the story that shapes us. Therefore, this is our myth, our mythos, okay? This is the story that tells us who we are. So a foundation story, which doesn't scare people as much as saying myth, okay? But just like Anzac is a foundational story for Australian identity, okay? And the, um, the, you know, the the story, the myth of the of the um, of the Australian bushy, is you know the reason why people in the city drive four wheel drives with 
bull bars on the front because we want to pretend we're, we're all bushmen at heart kind of thing, okay? It's that kind of thing. So as we're telling the Matthew story, are we saying to ourselves and to each other, so this is the story that is our foundation story in this parish, in this community, in my life. This is the foundation story. It all comes out of this. Okay. Um, then, then there's, of course, the focus on Jesus um, as, as, the, as the location. And this is perhaps one of the points where maybe Matthew and John would, would be in a, in a, a sort of conversation space. Um, they're using, I think they're using different categories and coming from different, totally different contexts, but they would agree, if they could see past the different language, they would agree that they're perhaps talking about the same thing. Um, for Matthew, Jesus is the unique presence of God within the community. Now he's not yet, Matthew is not Trinitarian, uh, and Matthew has no need for the Holy Spirit as a separate kind of expression of the Trinity. Yeah? But Jesus is God with us, in Matthew's way of thinking about that. Another way of saying that, which I've done in some of my writing, is say, well, you know, Jesus is the Christian expression of God, the Christian face of God. For us, we, we know what our God looks like and sounds like and so on, because we look at Jesus. That's our God experience. But as the final part of that dot point is kind of intimating which Jesus and whose Jesus are we going to be focusing on, okay? Is it the, and I'm not going to be so bold as to offer the answer, but just pose some questions, but you know, do we focus people on the creedal Jesus? Do we focus people on the canonical Jesus? Do we, do we think the challenge is to get people back in touch with the historical Jesus? I mean, there are a number of different strategies used by different parts of the church, but, um, um, but encountering Jesus and engaging with Jesus implies we've also made a decision about which, which version of Jesus we think our people need to engage with. And there'll be slightly different answers depending where people are on the theological spectrum. Um, and, and for some expressions of Christianity, um, even the idea that we should be still paying attention to Jesus is problematic. Okay. Um, some of the more sort of progressive expressions of Christianity are, um, are, are having difficulty knowing quite what to do with Jesus in terms of their overall faith kind of uh, mosaic, as it were. Okay, but what Lutz is saying is that when you're looking for the you know, four or five big ideas coming out of Matthew, one of the big ideas is that Jesus is the unique presence of God, the Emmanuel. Now that's, that's of course a faith perspective. That's not, a, that's not simply a historical um, fact. It's, it's a faith perspective. We, we, we recognize this person as having the significance of God for us, and other people don't. But that's, that's, the, that's the Christian perspective on Jesus. And so what are the practical implications of that in our parish and other places? One of the other things that Lutz picks up is the idea that Matthew's way of telling the story of Jesus is a little bit like the Exodus story at Passover. It's not simply a story about something happening back then. It's also a story about us now. And that particularly in the discourses, Jesus is directly addressing the listeners or the readers. It's not simply, now let me tell you the sorts of things Jesus used to say. It's kind of Jesus speaking in the first person, as it were, directly to the audience. And that the implication of that is that the Matthean community is not just hearing about the stuff Jesus used to do when he was here, they're being invited to imagine that Jesus is in fact still here, still with us, still amongst us. Hence, not only do you have Emmanuel at the beginning of the Gospel, but you have I'm with you always at the end of the Gospel. He's, he's not missing. He's not somewhere else. He's actually here amongst us. Um, so that idea that uh, as, we, as we're reading the Gospels, and one of the 
challenges I think for introducing people to the Bible and so on in a parish context is we've got to, somehow we've got to avoid making it a lesson in ancient history it has to be uh, an experience of God and Jesus present now invested though I am in the history and the background stuff uh, it has to be relevant now and you don't have to become an expert in the past in order to read the Bible in the present that's part of the dynamic of using the Bible today and so in a year of Matthew how do we do Matthew in a way which includes and draws in and celebrates the experience of the congregation now and doesn't treat them as children who need to be taught about stuff back then that they don't know about or something okay and the other big theme that uh, Lutz comments on is the question of Judaism and and I think he uh, he might address it in, in one part of his retrospect by talking about the conflict, Jesus in conflict with Israel, but then when he goes to the meaning of Matthew for today, he talks about Jewish-Christian relations. And so merging those together, um, the issue that I'm trying to pick up is um, it's a whole complex of ideas which includes dealing with the latent potential for anti-Semitism in Christianity, and particularly in the year of Matthew, where Matthew is superficially so, so so vitriolic in his attack on the Pharisees and the scribes, and when you get that famous, infamous blood curse, you know, let their blood be on, let his blood be on our children, on us and our children's heads, and so on. Um, we've got two thousand years of reading Matthew in an anti-Jewish way, in a way that releases all our latent anti-Semitism that's so, so present in Christianity. Um, and so really um, using, a, using Matthew, the year of Matthew, as a time to really think through what, you know, the, a number of issues related to the, the Jewish spiritual legacy and the relationship between Christians and Jews. Now that could be everything from having a... a um, an evening or you know, a Sunday night or a Saturday workshop where you get, say, a local rabbi to come in. It could be arranging a congregational visit to a nearby synagogue. Now, this is not going to work in Toowoomba or Chinchilla, but it's going to be easy on the Gold Coast or in Brisbane to do that sort of thing. Um, it could involve, um, th you know, thinking about some of the sort of, d trying to get a better sense of what Jewish spirituality was like. Uh, maybe picking up, for instance, Rabbi uh, Viva Kippen from Melbourne. She does fantastic workshops around um, Jewish table customs and rituals, which involves both cooking, preparing and cooking the food in the way that a Jewish mother will do it as a workshop. So people are experiencing the way spirituality and prayer is linked to preparation of food and domestic hospitality and meal experience and come away with a totally different view of ritualistic Jews and so on okay um, through to thinking about issues about Palestine and Israel and occupation and what does it mean to be the people of the promise and so on okay. so any number of the whole range of issues all of which would uh, invite the congregation to rethink its it's, it's kind of normal settings towards Jews. And, and how might we reclaim the word Pharisee, which really was not a term of abuse, but it's become a term of abuse. Don't be such a Pharisee. Okay? So um, planning study materials or sermons or guest speakers or seminars so that this aspect, of, that in the year of Matthew in particular, what Betty time in a cycle of a three year cycle and so on to think about you know our debt to Judaism uh, our differences from Judaism and the things we have in common that we can still do together there's a whole agenda there for a start okay so the third idea third set of ideas for this morning preaching and teaching Matthew probably stolen most of my own thunder by this stage all right, 
so one of the one of the threads I think to be working at how we might do this and it may not be an individual distinct Sunday but it might be a theme that comes up at various times during the year is to consciously address the question of where how this point of view or this idea from Matthew how does this sit within the wider context of early Gospels including the cubes including say the cube material or even say the Didache and for again without making people without giving the sense that people need to become experts like when, when, when I was growing up in the Church of Christ and I guess a, a late teen and soon to go to Bible College straight after year 12 um, one of the revered um, preachers in our community was also a lecturer in Greek and Biblical Studies at the Bible College at Kenmore but he would go into the pulpit with a pile of books under his like I come to a lecture sometimes but he'd go into the pulpit with a pile of books this high and sit them on the edge of the pulpit and he'd settle in for a 45 minute sermon well, well we, we wanted nothing less thank you we expected that if we didn't get that we felt we'd been cheated okay but it was it was um, you know I don't think he was quite separating the lecture room from the pulpit kind of thing okay so how do we do this but without getting into too much detail I think people appreciate getting glimpses that there is a there's a bigger context here that things like Matthew is Matthew is part of a diverse literature only some bits of which have survived and they're not all the controversial bits that get played on you know so current affair on the Palm Sunday night or something um, they're the bits that just inform our understanding of what it was like to be a Christian and from a Jewish background and so things like the Didache and some of the Q materials could could be relevant from time to time as we put Matthew in Matthew's own kind of context and that's taking the idea of parallels but specifically sort of related gospel parallels okay? um, and, and sort of noting that you know last year when we did this in Mark we saw this from a different, whatever, Luke, whatever, we saw it from a different different angle, etc. Okay? Because we will constantly be reading the gospel in conversation with the epistles, there is also an opportunity in preaching to be looking for those interactions. Um, what are the sorts of issues which are emerging in Paul's pastoral correspondence with the Pauline congregations, and how is that different or similar to what's emerging from the Matthean households. And if we can imagine Matthew as a distillation of the Jesus tradition from a whole diverse range of Matthean households, then we sort of set it alongside the Pauline literature, which is addressed to diverse Pauline households in different locations. And there'll be commonalities, but there'll be differences. Um, and it, and may, it may be as simple a point as you know our church is diverse the new testament is diverse yeah there's not simply one single way of being christian um so again related i guess is putting matthew in the context that matthew is some ways matthew is probably closer to the letter of james than it is to the pauline material and helping people see that yeah there were kind of traditions of interpretation and traditions of practice within early Christianity and importantly when the Pauline Johannine coalition kind of came to power okay in the second third century they didn't eradicate the voices that had different accents okay it's, it's a Catholic canon as in not papal it's a canon that reflects diverse forms of Christianity that don't always toe the party line as it were and that's part of what scripture does it gives us a range of wisdom and it's a gift from the church in the third and fourth and fifth century not because the documents were written then but because the documents were uh, were authorized or accepted and you know became canonical at that sort of stage and so uh, rather than and this this does require then some uh, theological sensitivity because the 39 articles tell us that the Bible is to be read in such a way that it only says one thing okay well maybe the 39 articles are wrong on that point just like they're wrong about capital punishment 
which is also one of the 39 articles. Okay? So, some of you are, have done Anglican Foundations, some of you have not, but I mean, um, Article 20, I think it is, says that you know, no part of Scripture is to be in read such a way that it's inconsistent with another part of Scripture. Well, <laughs> well, might you laugh, but that's, that represents a form of doing biblical theology in the 17th century, which is not the way we would want, we would choose to do biblical theology in the 21st century, unless we're graduating from more college, in which case we will do it that way. So, but you will have people in your congregation who want you to do it that way. And you'll have other people in your congregation who say that that doesn't work. Okay, so dealing with that ambiguity and, and helping people to see that within the scripture and within the church there is diversity. And it's not just a case of towing the party line. And it's certainly not a case of domesticating the Bible so it can only ever agree with what the church already thinks. Which I think is the problem with Article 20. Uh, and of course Matthew and the Jewish communities, and again that's just going back in and saying, well let's, you know, um, let's take advantage of the fact that, yeah, okay, all the Gospels are written by Jews, but Matthew is the Gospel who's most engaged with the Jewish question within first century Christianity. Okay? He's the one who's really trying to work out um, what is the relationship between Jesus and Torah? What is the relationship between the Christianity and Moses and so on? Now Luke is also dealing with that, but Luke has moved on. Luke is almost in a rescue bid, contrary to Marcion, to say, no, 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 let's not throw it out. Okay, but Matthew is still at a point where it's problematic. Luke is at a stage where, no, we're agreeing we're not throwing this stuff out. We're, we're claiming it. Okay. So Matthew's at a more, Matthew's in a different, so you can compare Matthew, sorry, Paul, Matthew and Luke, and they're three different points on a continuum to deal with how do we deal with the implicit tension between what we now know as Christianity and Judaism. For Paul, there's not a problem. You know, he's 100% Jewish, but he's also a follower of Jesus. Matthew is almost living at the very peak of that tension trying to hold it together and coming to realise that he's going to have to let go of his Jewishness and move to the Gentiles. And Luke has moved to the Gentiles and saying, don't throw the Old Testament out. Let, let's keep the Old Testament. Because that had, be, that had become a problem courtesy of Marcion and like-minded anti-Jewish people within early Christianity. So my way of putting the, you know, those things together would be to look at Paul, where the Old Testament is not problematic. Okay? Matthew, where it's becoming really hard to hold all this together, and Luke, where the tendency is to get rid of the Old Testament, but Luke is saying, no, no, guys, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's hang on to the Old Testament. Even though we're not Jewish, let's not get rid of the Jewish scriptures. So there's, there's a trajectory between... Paul, Matthew, and Luke. Now I happen to spread them out at you know roughly fifty-year intervals, but you don't have to have a fifty-year spread for that same trajectory to be there. Well, the problem is we don't know when the things are written. All we can do is guesstimate. I mean. Uh, if the letters of Paul are authentically Pauline, and there's debate about that, but assuming that most of the letters of Paul were written in Paul's lifetime, then we're dealing with basically the 50s and the first couple of years of the 60s. So Romans is 58, Thessalonians, First Thessalonians is 49 or 50, and you know, they're sort of in that kind of time frame. Um, um, Matthew's going to be somewhere between, you know, um, probably the mid 80s to about 105 somewhere in that period depending whether you go think it's closer to the destruction of Jerusalem or whether it needs a bit more time for the sort of rabbinic Judaism thing to emerge and um, Luke is either going to be a similar time to Matthew but in a different space intellectually or he's going to be you know, a decade or two or three later but still in a different space because for Luke um, 
the, there's no problem with the Gentiles. That's, there's no crisis over the Gentiles. The tension in Luke is how to, how to hang on to a little bit of Judaism, whereas, whereas that wasn't the issue for Matthew and it wasn't the issue for Paul. Paul is thoroughly Jewish but receives this as good news for the Gentiles. Matthew is struggling to hold it all together, being Jewish and coming to see that we're going to have to focus on the Gentiles. Luke is entirely Gentile but still wanting to keep a bit of the Jewish tradition. Yeah, and then the time frame is secondary. Doesn't yeah, I can see that. doesn't matter. I mean, there's somewhere between um, you know, there's about a well from the from the fifty. There's about a seventy to eighty year window from the the fifties of the first century to the Bar Kokhba revolt. So somewhere in that period, the New Testament gets written. I mean, it's, it's less than a hundred years. Um, and we, we quibble over whether it's 75 or 78. Oh, please, you know, <laughs> give us a break, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so, um, but there is, but there's, an, there's a tendency within, you know, um, Christian scholarship, if you like, to try and get everything as close to Jesus as possible. So there's the tiniest delay, because if it's close to Jesus, it's kind of better. It's more trustworthy. Okay. But... We don't treat any other literature that way. So I guess I'm saying, let's, let's, as much as we can, let's have an even playing field and apply the same rules to the way we treat biblical documents, to the way we treat other documents. Let them stand on their own feet in terms of methodology and then, deal, and then we just pick up the pieces and deal with it. Because end of the day, when, even if we are what, you know, wanting to be archaeologists or something, um, that's not what we are when we're talking about reading the Bible as people of faith. We're then talking about our practice, our, our identity, our faith. So. Now Matthew and the Empire um, will come into play, but of course when I'm thinking about Matthew and the Empire, I'm not really thinking about the Roman Empire. I'm thinking about the American Empire or the, you know, the empires we live and participate and benefit from ourselves. Okay? Um, systems of power. Okay, like I'm part of the kingdom of Apple, or whatever. But yeah, so what? What are the networks? What are the power arrangements which we participate in, and which we benefit from, and which in some ways are destructive of others? And how does Matthew? How does the gospel? How does Jesus challenge all that? Okay. Um, so what is the interface between being a disciple of Jesus? being a person of faith and dealing with politics and power in our kind of world. Okay? And some parishioners will not want you to talk about that. Okay? But the Bible, as Tim Costello, getting my Costello's confused, yes, Tim Costello, points out there's way, way, way more verses in the Bible about poverty than about homosexuality. Okay? And you wouldn't get that by listening to the leaders of the Australian Christian Lobby or various other people who present themselves as, you know, Christian spokesmen in Australian culture. Okay? And so that gets to the question then of Matthew and mission. Matthew ultimately had to break some hard news to his readers that the way we've been doing things is broke and we're going to have to change. And maybe that's your job as well. To gently suggest to your congregation that we're going to have to change something around here if we're going to be the people God wants us to be. And then you get all the jokes about how many Anglicans does it take to change anything. <laughs> change? <laughs> light bulbs? What do you mean light bulbs? Okay, so Matthew and mission. Um, Matthew had some challenging prophetic insights into where the church had to go in order to respond to what God was calling it to be. And maybe that's the biggest question of all in the year of Matthew. 
Are we prepared to change, do things differently in order to be the kind of church God now needs us to be? Okay. And part of all that and part of a teaching and preaching agenda might be, of course, to actually focus on some of the stuff which is distinctively Mathean. What are some of the distinctive Mathean passages? And the way you do that, of course, is to get into the the gospel um, you know, parallels and look for the passages that don't have parallels. So do the reverse thing. Instead of looking for Matthew in parallel with other passages, look for the bits either where Matthew has changed or where Matthew is this only person to tell that story. So what's what's the distinctive Matthean gift to us as church? As for pastoral strategies, um, I'll just mention a couple of things very, very briefly. I often found it helpful to use Advent to kind of set up the year of Matthew, okay, and, and deliberately have a couple of sermons during Advent where we talked about Matthew, Matthew in relation to other Gospels, some of the distinctive themes of Matthew, whatever, so that people are kind of, to some extent, at least the regulars, are tuned into the idea that during the next 12 months we're really going to be constantly coming back and talking about Matthew's angle on things. Um, you can also do an Advent series of talks or Bible studies or seminars you know that that are not done within the time constraint of a of the Sunday morning sermon um, people will you know, Anglicans will do a Lenten Bible study they'll even do an Advent study if you talk to them nicely okay um, so one possibly instead of doing it in the sermons another way is to do it as a series on Tuesday afternoons or Wednesday nights or whatever and then in the sermons you can always say as we're going to talk about next week or as we saw the other day this is one of those places da 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 so you're sort of linking it in in which case if you're doing a, a seminar say a Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon or something you might be giving an overview of what's going to happen in the lectionary between now and Easter then do another one around about this time of the year, looking at the second half. Um, lectionary notes, um, th thinking about what kind of information might it be handy for people to have in the pew sheet as background, or to have on the parish website these days, you know, lectionary notes and things. And there are, and there are plenty of online notes you can you can have links to from your, uh, that you can send out by tweets whatever to people in the congregation if you want to see a parish that's really starting to do this very well have a look at adam Lowe at st bart's in toowoomba i mean i mean adam Lowe anywhere he just happens to be at st bart's at the moment but his his style is very connected with with the sort of digital era so um yeah, you'll you'll find. I mean, if think, if I think back over the clergy that have had you know influence and so on over the last forty, fifty years, um, some of them are people who were very good at adopting the communication strategies that were available to them at the time. Whether it was sort of Ralph Wicks or various other people, they were they were masters at using the facilities that were available to them at the time. They didn't sit and wait for people to come to them. They were constantly communicating pushing stuff out now they didn't have Twitter they didn't have Facebook but they had other ways of communicating and they just did it constantly um, and that of course is one of the cultural differences between um, say Anglican churches which tend to say here we are um, baptisms weddings and funerals by appointment and other churches that are more proactive in terms of communicating and reaching out and connecting with people Okay, that's maybe one of the changes heading our way. So you don't have to write your own lectionary notes anymore. You just find some that you like as a series and you just point people to them from your parish website or your parish newsletter, which goes out digitally now rather than being run off on bits of paper and killing trees. Of course, thinking about home group, well, thinking about home groups for starters, let alone resources for home group. Okay, again, that's another way of getting into um, getting into the year of Matthew so uh, you might have a Matthew reading circle where people are encouraged to get together and read Matthew and um, they won't necessarily be the same chunks you're going to be doing last Sunday or next Sunday it might be that if you join a Matthew reading circle you're actually going to read the whole of Matthew and not just read the bits that are being used in church on Sunday that would be one of the ways of addressing the bits of Matthew which are overlooked. 
Um, the Pentecost seminar would be a similar thing to the Advent seminar, You're just introducing the major themes and the, the major part of the story that's coming up in the next four or five months. And then, of course, thinking about resources for yourself as the preacher. What are you going to be reading? What are you going to be drawing on to get ready? Now, you're probably not going to be reading Lutz's three volumes in the Hermenea series, but you, it's not a bad idea to get one commentary that you really like and enjoy that person's style and really read into that and make sure you're, you're reading around Matthew as you're going through the year of Matthew and um, carve out some time yeah, towards the end of the year so you do a bit of extra preparation for the following year. So in terms of bringing out the old and the new, going back to Matthew 13:52, having a preaching plan, having a teaching plan. So this is what I'm doing in the sermon, but this is what I'm doing in other parts of the parish, not just me, but this is what's being addressed in other parts of the parish life. Um, thematic focus, possibilities, particularly for home groups, and for seminars and so on. You could easily have a, um, a, a series of home groups or indeed a Saturday or a parish camp around the Sermon on the Mount, for instance. Could be a pretty grim parish camp, actually, but yeah, you could, anyway, you could develop, you know, you can use these kind of themes and um, partly it's about helping people both see the bigger picture but also pay attention to some of the details, which it's really hard to do with a Sunday morning paragraph soundbite. Okay, we've already thrown three other readings at them in the process and chucked in hymns and other things and um, we expect them to go away having engaged with Matthew. Encouraging peer-to-peer -peer learning. What can we do so that the people in the parish community are actually engaging as disciples and teaching each other and encouraging and supporting um, each other, mentoring each other. And that probably comes back to small groups and so on. And it's, it's been fascinating with the Bible 360 process to see the, the level of interest in small groups, but the number of people who've said things like, we'd love to be in a small group, but our parish priest doesn't allow us to have a small groups. Doesn't allow them. Doesn't allow them. Okay? All right. Yeah. Well, and it's to do with tiredness, and I've done this, this is my sixth parish, and I'm, I'm over home groups or whatever, you know, people getting jaded and so on. Um, but it was some of the parishes that apparently do not have home groups or small groups at the moment, I was surprised because they're parishes that have profiles as being very active evangelical sort of parishes, but don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily in that space at the moment. So it's a, it's a problematic area, okay? Um, and it's about dispersal and it's about losing control and relinquishing control. Um, and it, but even something uh, totally different, you could arrange, uh, particularly if you've got any performing arts students or people involved in um, performance, uh, why not do a oral performance of Matthew? So early in the year, people actually experience Matthew as a oral performance. Yeah, easier to do with Mark because it's only half as long. But um, yeah, there would be ways of doing it. Even we got to edit it back to some extent. But yeah, you know, are there ways of? And how are people going to get the whole Matthew, a bigger context? Okay. Um, so whether it's audio files that they listen to in the, while they're going to work in public transport, or if it's an oral performance, how are we going to uh, encourage people to? experience the text.